All right, y'all ready? Let's change. Some of, uh, some of us need to change. We've been, uh, we've been this series just inviting, inviting change into our lives. The, uh, uh, the concept is this. Whenever we say, hey, what would you like to change? A lot of people come up with, oh, there's this negative thing that I do, this behavior, and I don't want to do that anymore. I said, okay, what's, what's the positive behavior that you want to uh, substitute for that? Because sometimes it's hard to stop something. Sometimes it's easier to start something in its place. But at the core of this is not a behavior change. It's what? It's heart change, right? We want to change something about our hearts. And so if you haven't been with us for the last couple of weeks, let me uh, wrap it up in a, in a nutshell so you're kind of up to speed. Changeology is about changing something in your heart that you're becoming more and more like who God is in his character. And week one, we simply said this, change is possible. Because we were looking at, at 2 Peter chapter 1, and 2 Peter says, God's divine power has given us everything we need for a godly life. So change is possible. The second thing we talked about last week was change is a process. Because right after it says that change is possible, it then lists this, to the faith that you have in God to this relationship, it says add these things. And so we're gonna read it together. It's gonna show up right here on the screen. I need you to read this with me with a little gusto, all right? Oh Lord, I'm concerned. All right, hey Matt, are we gonna get that on the screen there? Here we come, there we go. All right, you ready? No, no, seriously, come on, no, no. (laughs) This is gonna be a long 35 minutes if you're not ready, okay. Here we go, read this with me. For this very reason, make every effort to add to your faith goodness, and to goodness knowledge, and to knowledge self-control, and to self-control perseverance, and to perseverance godliness, and to godliness mutual affection, and to mutual affection love. For if you possess these qualities in increasing measure, they will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Awesome. Good job. So that's what we're talking through. What is this progression, these building blocks of what change looks like? We started with this faith. Because you have faith in God, gives you this relationship with God. He says, through God's divine power, change is possible. You've been given everything you need for a godly life. On top of this change, though, uh, this faith is goodness. And goodness, we simply characterize it this way. It's you knowing what the right thing or the good thing to do It's your commitment and choice to say, I'm going to do the right thing at the right time in the right way at all costs. And it's a commitment. But honestly, those are just kind of, that's kind of the prep for this to just say, do you have this relationship with God and do you want to become more like God in your character? And if that's the case, that's faith and goodness. And so here's what we're going to add to it this week. Knowledge and (laughs) self-control. Now, self-control is the very thing that you think about when you think about change, right? Because that's the thing we fear we don't have enough of. And if we had more of it, we wouldn't have to change because we, have, we would have already changed it, right? I'm going to tell you this. Please don't add self-control before you add knowledge. Because if you add self-control, you will fail to see the change in your life. Knowledge is actually the critical thing. And here's how we're going to describe it this week. Change is brain work. I know that sounds like deeply theological, but it is the truth. Change is brain work. Add to your goodness knowledge. And it doesn't mean knowledge like, oh, I don't know, have any idea who Jesus is. This knowledge is adding truth or wisdom for the situation. So once you have this faith and this goodness, and then you add knowledge, which is the wisdom and the truth that God has for you to, to actually create a change in your life, Self-control will follow that. And here's what I mean. Change begins in the mind. Change begins in the mind, not the behavior, not in your self-control. This is found all over the scriptures. Let me just give you a couple verses here. Uh, In the Old Testament, God says this, that my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge, lack of understanding. Jesus himself said, the truth will set you free. Paul later wrote about this. He said, don't be conformed to the pattern of this world, but be transformed, be changed by the renewing of your self-control. No, that's not what he said, right? Some of you should read the Bible like you would know I'm lying to you. Like, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. It's our mental work. It's our brain work. Here's the two great things, these two great gifts that God has given us that can produce change in us. Here's the first one. It's truth. 
God's given us all the truth we need right here for us to experience change. The question is, it's not about hearing it once and knowing the truth. It's about constantly being reminded of it. But it's more than truth. And here's what I, I want you to get. It's reason. God's given us brains to reason through what are the implications of that truth. Let me give you an example, okay? Here's a scripture. It's pretty simple. Do not lie to each other. All right? This is found in, in Colossians 3.9. Maybe you write that reference down, read it this week. Do not lie to each other since you've taken off the old self with his practices and you've put on the new self which is being renewed in knowledge in the image of its creator. Look, another verse that talks about being renewed, the the brain work of your mind, being renewed in your knowledge. But if it says don't lie to each other, well, there's the truth. The question becomes this. How do I reason that out so that I know what the behavior that looks more like God and less like me? The reason tells me my reports at work then need to contain truth, not lies. My reasoning of this truth means that there's no misleading anybody by fabricating a scenario that is better than our reality. My expense report has to be accurate. My numbers cannot be adjusted to make me look better. And all of this is done through reasoning, meaning this. If you read a truth about who God is and who you and I should be, our God-given gift of reason has to figure out the implications for what that then looks like in our lives. And some of us just want to go, oh, this is a truth, but we haven't taken the time to do the brain work and say, what are the implications then of how I should then live? So when it says, husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, my ability to reason tells me, quit complaining to my spouse if I feel disconnected. Do something about it. I've never read the verse in the scripture that says, husbands, go to your wives and tell her you have needs too. It ain't in there. And so plan a date with your wife. Choose her, show her affection. Speak her language of love, not your language of love. That's all reason. Now, I'm gonna uh, give you a healthy dose of a guy by the name of Dallas Willard today. Um, Dallas Willard, before he passed away in 2013, was a professor of philosophy at USC. Not, not a pastor, but this guy who's a follower of Christ who has really done the brain work on what it looks like for people to change. And he writes a book called Renovation of the Heart. It's one of the best books that I'll never recommend to people. And what I mean by that is if you want to read it and you can read it, like, go for it. But it is such a highly academic book that some people who read it, they get it through chapter one, they're like, I have no idea what he's talking about, and I've read it twice. Like, me too. It took me months to digest this book. And I I think there's actually a a Dallas Willard book for dummies out there that I should have read. But I'm going to give you a healthy dose of what he writes about in this book, because his book is all about changeology. It's about the renovation of the heart and what he calls spiritual formation. Here's what he writes. The ultimate freedom we have as human beings is the power to select what we will allow or require our minds to dwell upon. We're not totally free in this respect, but we do have great freedom here and responsibility to try to retain God in our knowledge. We're not able to control every thought we have. Amen? Right? Sometimes we have these thoughts, we're like, wow, where did that come from? Or, but we do have the opportunity, the responsibility, and the ability to focus on what is it that our minds actually dwell on. Um, You want to have heart change so you don't get angry? Well, listen, you don't always get to uh, select your emotions, but you can select and pick what it is that you're thinking about. So let me ask this question. What gets in the way of this mind renewal? Well, what gets in the way of this, this mind change and this thing that uh, I want to be renewed in, in the, the knowledge and the understanding of my mind so that it might actually lead to a better behavior, that it might lead to an actual heart change? Here's what it is. What gets in the way of a renewed mind is this, disordered feelings. That's what gets in the way. Now, I'm going to say a couple things here and see if I can give you some insight into this. And I want to try and keep it simple, even though this is a really complex uh, concept Left brain people, 
that the left side of the brain, Matt was talking about this a little bit earlier, is the side of logic, rules, analysis, math, facts, and reason. The, the right side of our brain, though, responsible for creativity, intuition, music and arts, imagination, daydreaming, feelings. You can tell which side of the brain I'm on, right? Like how I operate. How many of you are, uh, you're the left brain logic types? Raise your hand. How many of you are the right brain creatives and see, and no one even said it with a woo woo. Like usually like people start getting creative on me when I ask that. Um, and some of you, you're having like this aha moment right now. And it's usually the left brain engineer types in the room who are going, see, I knew that's what was wrong with this world. Feelings. If people just had less feelings, the world would be better. Now, just remember, what did I say actually hijacks the renewal of our mind? Not feelings. Disordered feelings. Um, the truth is this. We love feelings. It's why we go to the movies, Right? I mean, whether it's a horror flick that creates uh, fright in our feelings, we just love the, the adrenaline of our feelings. Action films, dramas, tear jerkers. I mean, we love experiencing our feelings. I mean, it's one of the ways that Nicholas Sparks has made a fortune. Writing books, right? The Notebook. Someone actually had to tell me what he wrote because I haven't seen or read <coughs> The Notebook unlike one of the other pastors on our staff. <clears throat> Although he claims that he only has half a brain and it's all logic and leads us in worship sometimes. <laughs> He's read the book, watched the movie, and some other movie about like sisterhood and pants and ya ya, whatever, okay? I don't get it. He, he says he has no emotional side to him, yet he watches movies like this. And so he's He's, I guess he's changed a lot. Maybe his wife is making him watch those, and I just wanted the chance for you to get to know him a little better and share that with you. That's why I love movies like McFarland, right? This down and out town in the Central Valley who people feel trapped, like we, we can never become something, and by the end of the movie, they rise up, and they're, they're these cross-country champions, but it's so much more than a, a race. It's about a mental capacity in life that you get out of being stuck. I love stories like that, don't you? I mean, feelings aren't the wrong thing. Feelings are healthy and good and God-given. That's why we love music. Music enters the heart through the back door and moves us in a way that reason just can't. It's one of the reasons why God tells us in the scriptures, sing a new song to me. Let music be a part of your worship. That's why we sing every week. These moments that I speak with you, I'm grabbing logic and reason and saying, let's make sense of the scriptures. But when we sing, it's like the back door to your heart that God's like, I'm here and I might not enter through here. I might enter in the other side of your brain. So feelings, they're God-given gifts so that you and I can experience love and joy and laughter and peace, and hope. However, disordered feelings occurs when our feelings hijack our reasoning, and they lead us to do things that intellectually we know are not good for us. <laughs> That's why you dated that guy in high school when you knew it wasn't good for you. That's why you bought that thing you knew you couldn't afford it's because of those disordered feelings. That's why people cannot stop consuming certain types of food, alcohol, or they can't cut back on the obsessive exercise routine that they're on. It's because of disordered feelings. Disordered feelings are why we verbally attack our spouse at times, and they go, whoa, 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 what led to that? It's disordered feelings. Now, one of the things that makes this unbelievably challenging is if we suggest to our world out here that we should not fulfill our feelings, that, that we should not act upon them, people get insulted. Like, what, what are you talking about? You, you, of course you should act upon your feelings. Like, God gave you those feelings. Mm, maybe. If they're ordered properly or if they're in line with reason, truth, and understanding. We live in a world that makes responses based off of feelings. You might never say one of these phrases I'm about to say, but you might have your own way of saying it. You might say things like, listen, I just need to follow my heart in this. What is that? 
It's about following our feelings. Hey, I'm just trying to keep it real. There's another saying that's just about you following your heart. I got to be true to me. I'm going to keep it 100, whatever that means. Like, it's all this concept that whatever it is I feel, I should fulfill that feeling. Let me just say this. Every feeling we have is not ordered properly and according to truth and wisdom. We have feelings all the time that are absolutely disordered. Let me give you some hope that comes from Dallas Willard. Here's what he writes. We do not have to be victimized by destructive feelings. Even the feelings that harm us are, for the most part, not bad in and of themselves, but are somehow not properly limited or subordinated. They're out of order. Feelings are, with few exceptions, good servants, but they are disastrous masters. Isn't that great? Well, disastrous masters, if they control you and tell you what to do, how to do it, when to do it, no, 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 no. They're great servants. They help us experience the richness of life. But they're disastrous when they start controlling us. He goes on to, to, to speak on how he deals with feelings. He says, interestingly, you can't evoke thoughts by feeling a certain way. So he's saying, don't try and change your feelings, try and change your thoughts. He goes on. But you can evoke and to some degree control feelings by directing your thoughts. Our power over our thoughts is of great and indispensable assistance in directing and controlling our feelings, which themselves are not directly under the guidance of our will, our choice, our decision. We cannot just choose our feelings. Here it is. You can't choose your feelings. But to some degree, you can choose what it is that you think about. Here's what I think is fascinating. Psychology is finally understanding what the scriptures have been talking about for thousands of years. It doesn't say be transformed by the, re by the renewing of your feelings. It, it says be transformed by, by the renewing of your minds. And how do you do that? With truth and with reason, as opposed to with, well, change your feelings. Now, let me share with you how not to do this, okay? So in every week we've talked about, here, here's what, what change is. It's possible, it's a process, it's brain work, right? And in the midst of that, there's, there's God's part and, and there's, there's my part. God's part is he's given us this truth and he's given us this, this reason and now here's our part. Let me tell you how not to do this. I had a friend of mine years ago describe to me the conversation she would have with her husband. And sometimes these would get heated and sometimes it was, it was just a lot of conflict and she kept trying to describe to him, but this is how I feel. And he would try to, to reason it out. Well, this is what logic says. I know, but this is what I feel. And they finally came to kind of the point and the climax is crescendo. And he's like, listen, they're just feelings. <laughs> um, just in case that's what you just wrote down, men. Don't. It's just, it will not go well for you. He's kind of right, though. What he's trying to say is, your feelings are real. It's not that they're fake. They're real, but they're not facts. And I, I'm not trying to persuade you this because you're like, oh, there's a left brain pastor trying to disregard the right brain people. No, no, no. I, I'm not. Feelings are real. They, they can definitely be a, a temperature gauge as to how well your marriage is doing. But let me just suggest this. We need to Engage our minds in a way that we're not allowing feelings to dictate our reactions to our spouse. Now, th th this is just one scenario. Let me give you a truth here. The mind focused on truth realigns our feelings. And I'm going to give you a scripture on this. And I would highly encourage you, memorize this. Read it over and over and over again. And here it is. The mind focused on truth realigns our feelings. This, here it is in Philippians chapter 4, verses 8 and 9. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. And the Greek terminology here is think about it again and again and again. Don't stop thinking about it. Let this be the constant practice. So what happens next? Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put it into practice and the God of peace will be with you. Change your thinking. Focus daily on the things that are true and good and right and admirable. And if there's anything that, that's worthy of praising God for, dwell on that stuff and then show some action. 
And guess what's going to follow? This peace with God. That's the, the feeling part of it. Here's what I believe. I think what the scriptures are alluding to is that if you can change what you think about, you can change a mind. And if you can change a mind, you can change a behavior. And if you can change a behavior often enough, you can change a habit. And if you change a habit, God can change a heart. But most of the time, we run to self-control and just go, oh, you know what, let's try and control. I'm going to try and control myself a little bit better. No, 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 no. We have to change our minds. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. I would suggest this. In that scripture, in Philippians chapter 4, I would suggest the daily practice of putting those words down and put it in your Bible somewhere where you're just looking at it. And would you write down, what's good in my life? What's good and true in my life? What's noble about me? What is the thing that's worthy of giving God praise? And it reorients us instead of, oh, it's so bad. Because when we have that thought of, oh, it's so bad, that's when we're tempted to act like we don't know God. If you can change what you think about, you can change a mind. If you can change a mind, you can change a behavior. You change a behavior. Often enough, you can change a habit. If you can change a habit, you can change a heart. So if that's the daily practice, what do you do in the heat of the moment? Whether it be in a marriage relationship or whether it be just you by yourself, how do you actually change a behavior when you start having negative feelings in, in that moment? Um, a couple years ago, we did this series called Crucial Conversations about how you deal with this with people. And one of the things it comes to is, why do you have the negative feelings you do? If, take a look at this uh, illustration right here. There's four parts to it. See and hear, tell a story, feel, and act. How many of you recognize this? You've seen this before. Four of you were at that last series. Awesome. This is new to the rest of you. Um, let me give you this scenario. You walk into the room, the front door of, uh, from work. You've been gone all day. And the change that you're trying to make, the heart change you're trying to make, is you want to appreciate your spouse more. So you've decided, here's the things, that the behaviors that go with that, and you renew your mind, tell yourself the truth. And you get home from work, and what you hear when you walk through the door is, what took you so long getting home from work? <laughs> We don't like questions like that. In your mind, you start thinking. You're smart enough not to open your mouth. But what you start thinking is, you don't trust me? You think I was wasting time. Why would you even have to ask that question? You should really say something positive like, great to see you. I missed you. Our feelings, depending on how healthy our relationship is, can quickly spiral out of control. But here's the truth. Their words didn't create that feeling in you. And we want to, it would be really nice to say, listen, you said this and I felt this way. But between your seeing and hearing something and you having feelings, there's a spot in there that we have to recognize that actually happens in a fraction of a second. And this is what it is. We tell ourselves a story the story we tell ourselves is, oh, my spouse doesn't encourage me, doesn't trust me, doesn't want me, doesn't think I'm responsible. My spouse is negative, judgmental, critical, nosy. And then all of a sudden, you have this feeling that's negative, and I'm going to call it a disordered feeling. And then all of a sudden, we act. And the wise person only responds internally with, well, why don't you? And all of a sudden you have this argument in your head and your mouth never opens. The unwise spouse actually opens their mouth. <laughs> and they say something that they regret later on that leads to a bigger argument. But even the wise spouse, spouse who keeps their mouth closed, it doesn't bring them any closer to their husband or wife. There's still a gap there. There's still this negative conversation happening. So how do you deal with with that. I'm going to tell you, here's how it happens. You have to change the story. You have to first recognize when you have these negative feelings, I'm telling myself a story. What is the story that I'm telling myself? And you're going to have to do this this morning. Whatever change it is that you said, I want to make this heart change, 
and it means I can't do these negative behaviors, but I really want to engage in these positive behaviors. You have to, this morning, I hope you'll do this at some point, either on your phone, type it in, or you'll write it in your notes. How does this apply to you? What's the negative story you're telling yourself that are creating this, these disordered feelings? I'm hoping you'll recognize it. The brain work part of this is that we have to recognize the disordered story, this disordered feelings, and then the story we're telling ourselves, and tell a new story. Let me give you that same scenario. Maybe the story is, you know, wow, my spouse is worried about me. Isn't that sweet? I know some of you are like, really, Pastor? Come on. Let me give you another one. My spouse really cares about me and must have been really wondering if I was okay. My spouse really cares about me and was looking forward to me being at home. That means they really value our time together. Totally true statements, but it's a totally different story that we're telling ourselves. The brain work is to recognize. Brain work happens two ways. One, it's daily, right? Daily in Philippians chapter four. Focus your mind on whatever is true, whatever is right, whatever is noble. And in the heat of the moment, recognize the, negative, the, dis, the disordered feelings and recognize the story you're telling yourself and tell a different story. Here's in your notes. Our feelings are not a choice. You don't get to pick your feelings. You just feel what you feel. Our feelings are not a choice, but feelings can be reordered with reason if, you, if we tell ourselves a different story. An insight from Dallas Willard, feelings that can be successfully reasoned with can be correctly corrected by reality. Only in those, he's saying not everybody actually does this, but only those who have the habit and are given the grace to listening to reason, even when they're expressing violent feelings or in the grip of them. They will never willingly choose to allow feelings to govern them. They will carefully keep the pathway open to the house of reason and go there regularly to listen. <laughs> I love that. There's a house of reason, and the pathway to the house of reason is always open, and they go there often to listen. It's not letting one half of our brain hijack the other, and it's not being all logic and forgetting that feelings are actually God's given gift to us. Different scenario. Let's say there's a person who realizes that they just drink too much. I mean, they drinking alcohol, but they never just stop at one or two. They are, they're, they're in it to win it, really. I mean, they, they just can't stop, and they have a problem getting drunk, and they realize it's had an impact on their relationships and is not good for their health, and so their change is, I don't want to get drunk anymore. I want to I wanna be in control of my life, and they have this faith in God, this relationship with God, they're saying, God, give me, give me strength to do that. They've added goodness. They've recognized, like, here's the good and the right thing to do. So I'm going to do the right thing in the right way at the right time at all costs. And that's what they've said. So they've done all the prep work. And now they get to this, this situation, and they have these, um, these negative feelings. And let me describe it this way. Um, I've heard from alcoholics in the past that they describe it this way. There's a saying that alcoholics have. It goes this way. It goes, pour me, pour me, pour me, pour me another drink. And what, what they're saying is, listen, I get this negative thing in my head that says my life is bad, this is negative, this is, and they start, to pour me, I'm, everything is so negative, therefore my resulting behavior is pour me another drink. And if you tell that person, listen, you just need to have more self-control, you might as well just slap them in the face. It's of no use at all. One of the things that they can do, though, is start changing the dialogue in their head and start changing the story, which leads to actually feelings that can change. Instead of, oh, poor me, they can turn around and say, what is the good thing that is going on in my life? Let me keep it really simple. I had a bed to sleep in last night. I got up and had coffee this morning, and it was even good coffee. I had food to eat today. I have a job. I have at least one person in my life who loves me. Could you put the list longer? Of all the things that are actually good, right, noble, and then you get into, so what has God done for me? Well, that list is long too. And we can change the story from poor me, poor me, to I'm currently struggling with this, but I have these great things going on in my life. Therefore, my feelings will start to shift. Instead of becoming disordered, I'm feeling right with God. Now listen, if you need a couple truths and some things to hang on to, 
Let me give you two of them. Here's one. God loves you just the way you are, but he loves you so much he won't leave you the way you are. Listen, if you're struggling with something right now, hear that truth and write it down. God loves you just the way you are, but he loves you so much that he doesn't want to leave you the way that you are. It's a statement about transformation. It's a statement about changeology. Let me give you another statement. It's found in 1 Corinthians 10, 13. Write that down. I don't think it's in your notes there, but 1 Corinthians 10, 13. Listen to this. No temptation has overtaken you except what's common to mankind. And God is faithful, and he will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can endure it. If you're in the middle of trying to make a change in your life, you, please tell yourself, there's a way out. There's an escape. This doesn't have to overrun me. Between those two truths, you can just hang on to those two for a little bit and get you through the week. But we have to change the story that we're telling ourselves. By the way, one of the stories we often tell ourselves is, I have no hope, I have nothing good in my life, no one cares for me, and I have no control over this. You're right, you don't currently. But you have to start rewriting the story where God, through the support of other people, through God's strength, through my faith, this commitment to goodness, and now this knowledge that I can start retelling my story, through that change is actually possible. Um, by the way, this is the essence of self-control. This is the essence of as our minds change. And by the way, this is only a part of it. We're not even through the list yet. And there's a lot of other components to how people change. And so please don't hear me say that, well, you know, if you just memorize a verse in Philippians 4, 8, and 9, that your problems will all go away and you'll develop some self-control. It's a piece of the pie. It's part of this building process. But self-control, if we attack it from the front door and just say, I just need to have more discipline, never works. Here it is. Change what you think about. You can change a mind. You change a mind, you can actually change your feelings. And if you change those, your mind and feelings, you can change a behavior. You change a behavior long enough, you change a habit. You change a habit, God can change a heart. And that's what we're after. And I know for some of you, you're like, man, it seems like it would be better to just pray and ask for the miraculous. God changed my heart and then my behavior will come. That would be awesome, wouldn't it? That's why most Christians actually never experience life change. Because they're sitting around praying and waiting for God to do the miracle. Nothing wrong with praying. Hear me, okay? <laughs> I pray. I believe in prayer. It's a good thing. But God wants us to work and put every effort. I mean, in 2 Peter it says, make every effort to add these things to your life. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to write down one more thing. And this is pertaining to your story, not my story. And I want you to write down, as I ask kind of these questions, what, what's the negative feelings that you have? The disordered feelings that are coming out? And what's the story you're telling yourself? A couple questions for you. Number one, what feelings are getting in the way of your change? For you left brain people, logical, you're like, I have no idea. That's okay. <laughs> Go to the next question. The second question is, what story are you telling yourself about someone else? Or what story are you telling yourself about you that is creating negative feelings? Listen, this isn't easy, and it's not something that I'm thinking in the next 10 seconds, you're going to write it down, there's going to be this mind-blowing clarity, and it's going to start changing your feelings and changing your behavior. This honestly takes work, but I believe it's absolutely biblical. This is not psychology 101. Psychology is catching up to what it is that God has been saying for thousands of years. The third question is this, what will you do to add knowledge and truth daily in your time with God so that your mind is renewed and strengthened? Listen, the truth piece that someone needs to hear over here so that they can reorder their feelings and go, man, this is, this is the truth I need, that there is no temptation, hmm, let me try that again, there is no temptation that, that has overtaken me other than what's common to mankind, that God will always provide a way out. Maybe that is the truth you need. Maybe there's another truth as you read the scriptures and you spend time with God. What I'm asking you to do is, as you spend time with him, what is he saying to you from his word? What is the truth that you need to grab onto and go, that is true for me in my life? 
And I'm going to keep retelling myself and reminding myself of that truth so it changes my thinking. One of the best scriptures that I've, I've read is just Psalm 23. And I told you, we did a study on this earlier this year. And I just told you, like, I, I repeat this myself, this verse to myself all the time. I was on a long run yesterday. I'm running on the trail. And for some reason, I started getting into this argument in my head as I run. I, running for me is like real, it's brain work because... You just start thinking about things, and it just gives me space. And so I started having this argument in my head, and I was like, why, why am I arguing about this? And all of a sudden, I just started, okay, Lord, here it is. The Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures. I probably, and by the way, I'm running, saying this out loud, trying not to be weird and weirding out people around me as we're running, right? And I'm saying this out loud to myself. What's it doing? It's reminding me about what my truth is, and I'm truthing my way into my feelings so that I'm not feeling negative about that. Question, what's the truth that God wants you to know that will change your story? The last one is this. How will you be open to reason and telling a new story in the heat of temptation or in the heat of conflict? You know what's interesting about this? There's all kinds of tools that go into, that we can use that can be used for the transforming of our minds. You know what's interesting? None of them are new. They're all ancient practices that are often called spiritual disciplines. Reading the scriptures is an ancient spiritual discipline. Memorizing God's word so that it actually is in your heart is an ancient spiritual discipline. Meditation, not the emptying of your mind, but the focusing of your mind on scripture is an ancient spiritual discipline. The answers are not new. The reason that these answers don't work for us is that we don't actually do them. One of the most um, difficult things I read in all of Dallas Willard's book, he writes this way, the problem of spiritual formation among those who identify themselves as Christians today is not that it is impossible or that effectual means to it are not available. The problem is that it is not intended. I mean, we don't do it. People do not see it and its value and decide to carry through with it. They do not decide to do the things Jesus did and said. God will empower your change, but he will not do it for you. Will you do the hard work? So if change is possible and change is a process and change is brain work, On the other side was this, so what's your job? And we tried to do a psych week of like, hey, emotionally get ready for this. You need to be prepared and and, and get ready for this. What's the change you want to work on? Here's this week. The P is called perspire. Ball's in your court. Daily, renew your mind. And in those moments where you're tempted with, I'm telling myself a story that's negative and it's leading to a behavior that I don't like, would you do the hard work? To tell a different story. And in the midst of that, we're only halfway through what change looks like according to Second Peter. But we're going to pause there today and just say, the week in front of you is filled with opportunities. And it is filled with challenge of whether you will change or not. But really what it requires, according to First Peter, make every effort. It will require you perspiring the work, and doing it. Most people will never do it. They'll just wish they had. But I want to be the kind of church that motivates you and tells you the hard truth that says, ball's in your court. Make every effort to add to your faith goodness, and to your goodness this knowledge, and to knowledge self-control. Let's bow our heads. Let's pray. Lord, uh, We absolutely need your help if we're going to become more like you. There's moments where we're not like you and we regret it. Help us to recognize the truths we need to learn. Help us to focus our minds on that which is true and noble and right and pure and lovely, admirable and excellent. If there's anything that we're going to praise you about, help us to focus our minds on that. But God, I also pray that in the moment, in the heat of the moment, when whether it be in a relationship or whether it be us just being tempted to be the old us, God, would you wake us up to the negative feelings and the bad story we're telling ourselves. God, help us to tell a different story. Help us to find the way out that you have given us every single time. God, would you give us courage to do the work this week? And Lord, I look forward to stories of great change 
that people will experience in this church as we enter into this process. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.